Very good. Okay, let's start. So, uh, welcome everybody to the webinar uh, today. Uh, the topic will be uh, exotic patterns of uh, Faraday waves, and uh, the speaker of today is uh, Lorette uh, Tuckerman. Uh, as usual, I introduce uh, uh, the speaker very briefly, and then uh, I give her the, the floor. So, uh, Lorette Tuckerman is a senior researcher at uh, PMMH, uh, Physique et Mécanique de Milieu Hétérogène. Uh, an institute affiliated with the CNRS, uh, Centre National de Recherche, de Recherche Scientifique, uh, ESPCI, and uh, Sorbonne University. Uh, prior to this, uh, she was at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and uh, she obtained her bachelor and PhD degrees from Princeton and MIT. Uh, she studies hydrodynamic instabilities, such as those in uh, uh, quiet flows, thermal convection, and uh, Faraday waves using the methods of uh, computational fluid dynamics and uh, of bifurcation theory. She is a fellow of uh, the American Physical uh, Society and uh, of Euromac. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Lorette Tuckerman for the webinar of today. So uh, Lorette, I stop sharing my screen and uh, you can share yours. Okay. There we go, we see your screen. Yes, and I'm making, hopefully, I, I, <laughs> what I want to be shared, hopefully is being shared now, no, hold on. Come on. Ay, ay, ay. Hello? Yes. Yes, okay, where's my uh, presentation? Oh dear. Come on, come on presentation, let's go. Be a nice presentation. I should never have let you turn it off. <laughs> uh -huh. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Here, let me stop sharing. Okay. okay? Yes, sure. Let me get my presentation up front. Where is my presentation? One moment. Yeah, I'll take your time, no worries. So you're gonna see nice things, hopefully, once I get my keynote up again. Yes. Well, my keynote not up, I wonder. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah, I'll just quit it and start again. Yeah, maybe because it was a full screen, so it's- Yeah, something like that. Mm. So in the meantime, I take care of people who are trying to enter. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay, so I have it on my screen. Now let me get it on 
um, on the uh, Zoom screen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. It went off to a different desk. One of those awful things. I hate other desks. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I really don't like other desks. Let's see. How do I get it to the same? Come on, go to the desk. No, no. Um, okay, but I'll be okay. Share screen. There we go. There we go. But now yeah. I will want it to be play. Yeah. yeah. Yes. There. Okay. Perfect. There. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you uh, about Faraday instability. And uh, so, uh, these are um, numerical simulations of a fluid uh, layer, a thin fluid layer, which is oscillated. Can you see me? Can people uh, see me? Yeah, we see the cursor and we also see the camera. No, but can you see my face or my... Uh, uh, just on a side, it's, the slides are clean. Yeah, but you can see me. Okay, so if I do this, you see me? Yes, yes. Okay, right, so that's what I wanted to do. Um, so this is a fluid layer that is oscillated vertically. And for a certain amplitude, uh, up to a certain amplitude of oscillation, uh, the surface remains flat. What you have is a uh, force going up and down, alternating, but it's, um, it is uh, opposed, equally opposed by uh, hydrostatic uh, pressure. So it's the same thing that, you know, you, uh, why doesn't all the air in a room fall to the ground? It's because the hydrostatic pressure up and the gravity down. And so too, you can do this to a fluid and, and it's um, your, uh, uh, acceleration and uh, pressure uh, opposing one another it remains flat, but then you have an instability that forms uh, waves. Okay, and now we have to, there. Okay, so here's a, uh, here's a schematic of a oscillating uh, Faraday experiment, fluid wave, and here's a movie of those square waves you just saw. Uh, you see that a, a maximum becomes a minimum, becomes a maximum, becomes a minimum. And um, so this is the oscillation here. We usually consider it to be an oscillating gravity. We act as though the, st the container is stationary and it's gravity that's oscillating. The uh, main patterns that are seen are those that uh, tile the plane, uh, namely uh, stripes or rolls, squares, and hexagons. But I'm gonna tell you about uh, patterns that are more exotic than that. Um, so the first to study, I mean, people must have undoubtedly seen this before, but the first to study scientifically was Faraday in 1831. And so now I bring you to um, history, um, uh, hydrodynamic stabilities. So here's Faraday doing his experiments in 1831. And you see that um, the other standard uh, hydrodynamic stability uh, problems, the ones you maybe know better, Rayleigh-Bernard convection telequoid flow, were done afterwards in um, 1890s and uh, uh, 1905 or so by Bernard and by um, Quet. Quet in 1890 or so, Bernard in uh, 190 something. And then the linear stability analyses were done by Rayleigh and by Taylor. You know, each time we have a Frenchman who does the experiment and an Englishman who does the uh, linear stability analysis in the inviscid case here. But you see that nothing is happening with Faraday all these years until in 1954 was done the inviscid linear stability analysis by Benjamin and Ursel. Um, and then um, again, we have some number of years during which are carried out the first numerical simulations, first in 2D and then in 3D of Rayleigh-Bernard convection taylor Couette flow over here. And again, nothing happens until uh, the 1990s and the 2000s where there's finally viscous instability, uh, viscous stability analysis. Notice that this was done a uh, long time ago for those other instabilities. And then finally 2D and 3D numerical, numerical simulations. So, uh, so it's um, Faraday waves is uh, kind of late to the game, but that's very good for me. Hello, come on. Um, 
because um, I because of this lack of focus on it, I got to be um, the first to do the uh, viscous stability analysis here, um, uh, just because it had been neglected as a stability problem, and I got to do the first 3D numerical simulation for the, again, for the same reason, not because it was so intrinsically difficult, but it just wasn't on the, um, on the map, on the charts, on the whatever. Um, so first, let me tell you what you're seeing here, and then I'll go back to the uh, previous slide. This is the linear inst uh, stability analysis of Benjamin and Ursel done in 1954. Um, what, are, what is this? This is K, a uh, wave number, and this is an acceleration uh, non-dimensionalized by gravity. I guess we really should non-dimensionalize the K, but uh, it's custom not to. And um, so what are these things? Inside what are called tongues here, uh, you have subharmonic, harmonic, subharmonic, harmonic, subharmonic, harmonic, subharmonic response. Over here, you don't have Faraday waves in the white places. And what means subharmonic and harmonic and subharmonic? Well, here, I'm going to show you, and this is where I'm hoping you can see me. Okay, so um, let's see if I can do this without opening up. Okay, so here is the layer, right? Two, 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 two. Okay, and now here's harmonic. Right, that makes sense, right? And here's subharmonic. Right, so the period of the subharmonic is doubled. The max, min, max, min, max, min. And for the harmonic, you have max, 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 max. Okay, everybody understand? Yes? Yeah, I think it was very clear, yes. Okay, good, okay. So this is, um, uh, this is Benjamin and Ursel, 1954, and the result of including, okay, the, and he, they showed that the Faraday stability problem re, re, um, uh, reduced to the Matthew equation, which, uh, where is the Matthew equation from? I guess maybe 100 years before, 50 years before, something like that. And if you add viscosity, what happens is that the tongues become rounded, uh, as you can see here, and uh, so they lift up. And so you have a threshold here. Here, the threshold is always zero, even though the tongue is extremely thin. Here, it's got um, here it's got a actual width. Here, it's smart. You know, it's each time it's an it's a higher order cusp. These lines here, excuse me, these lines, these points, these successive points, are um, uh, are the thresholds for the um, the the, the um, uh, inviscid case. And let me re return now to what I uh, had before, which is uh, back before viscosity and the, um, the, the, uh, our great um, ancestors, Rayleigh and Lamb. And probably many of you are familiar with this uh, formula, omega squared equals GK plus sigma over rho K cubed. And what is all this? Well, G is gravity, sigma is per surface tension, rho is density. So this is um, cap gravity capillary waves. K is the wave number, as we were watching before, and omega is the frequency. So I think the way that these, uh, what are, these are uh, presented in Rayleigh and Lamb is if you excite something, if you have a flat surface and you've excited a, um, uh, uh, something with wave number K, then it's going to oscillate at this omega frequency. Okay, you impose a perturbation now. now Again, without viscosity, you don't see it then actually come back to nothing, which you would if it was below threshold, uh, but you just see it going this. In the Faraday case, this formula still is true, again, in viscid, but it's the other way around. What we're doing is we are imposing a frequency, and from that, we are extracting a K. That is to say, if you... Um, if you shake at a certain frequency, you get waves with a certain wave number, a certain wave length. So in this way, uh, Faraday is quite different from Rayleigh Bernard and Terraquet. Rayleigh Bernard and Terraquet, we know what wavelengths we get. We have a plaque like this, or there's space between two cylinders like this. And what is our wavelength? Well, it, it is dictated by the width of the gap. These rolls fill up the uh, space between the gap. And this is what decides it. 
Whereas in uh, Faraday, it's uh, you can tune that wavelength by nothing geometric. You don't have to make a new container or something. You just change the frequency. Um, then uh, there, this, there's this formula here of omega naught uh, equals n omega over two. Um, what is this? Well, this has to do with um, here. This is one uh, one half. One, uh, two halves, three halves, four halves, five halves, six halves, seven halves. We'll look a little more about that probably later. Uh, and then this is a picture, a still picture of this uh, first simulation of Faraday waves. This is in three dimensions. You see that we don't only have the uh, fluid surface, we also have the fluid velocity. And you see how when you have a maximum here, um, you're about to uh, have fluid coming in and now the top is going to go down and you see how now the, the fluid at the bottom below the surface the fluid is leaving um you know kind of going splat um so it's uh anyway it's it's delayed by half a period okay um so all of this was done uh using um the front tracking method um which is navier stokes uh and this is my colleagues that did this work maybe i should go back to the first thing here. Yes, my colleagues Damir, Shurag, Jalal Shergi, and Song Wong, they did, uh, they wrote this code called BLUE, and these have been the students and postdocs and interns that have carried out um, the investigations that I'm going to show you. Uh, but the, the code um, is very nice code called BLUE, Co as in code BLUE, you know, like uh, who has watched medical shows, you know, code blue is when you have a heart attack, they say code blue, code blue, and then they do things to you so you uh, you don't die, right? Everybody knows that. Anyway, they called it code blue as a kind of reference to that. Okay, so this is the method. Um, so I have very little to do with that. This is Navier Stokes, pressure, um, viscosity. Now notice you have a density and a viscosity here, dynamic viscosity. And the way they do it is they have fluid below and above, mm -hmm which just happens to have different density and viscosity above and below. The uh, fluid container um, is filled with cubes uh, all over this, below and above. And the interface is tiled with triangles, triangular deformable 2D mesh. And the cubes interact with the triangles in the following way. They, um, the surface, is advected by the velocity, which is calculated with a Navier, usual Navier-Stokes here. And here's the uh, oscillating um, gravity term. Um, and the um, uh, fluid position, the interface, gives you the, uh, the curvatures and all that. And that gives you the surface tension, which is a term in Navier-Stokes which affects the velocity. So, so the velocity adv advects the interface and the interface through the surface tension uh, affects the velocity. And the authors of this method, the former, of the of, uh, founders of it are people like Trugvasa and, and Peskin. So uh, this film you've already, I uh, know, <laughs> whenever I click this, yeah. This is the hexagonal, uh, these are hexa hexagons, and these are squares, squares you saw already, and here's hexagons. Um, so you see that um, you don't see it so well, uh, now, but you see each one is surrounded by six bumps. Each one is surrounded by six. And these first investigations were done by Nicolas Perrinet uh, in around 2008, 2009. Um, so these nice hexagons, um, here are a nice color pictures of them at four phases. This is subharmonic. Um, so the total oscillation period is twice the uh, imposed one. And um, you can see that the minima and the maxima are quite different. There is no symmetry between up and down. You see that the, uh, in this case of simulation, the fluid layer is quite thin. Uh, so here's a t equals zero. And this is t equals uh, a, qu a quarter period. And you have these maxima here. And you see here, this is, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned perhaps this is, um, uh, periodic in the horizontal directions. So this th thing here is surrounded by six hills, one, two, three, four, five, and then six over here. This one is surrounded by one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then the sixth one repeated there. 
Uh, and then here, here we have a next phase. Here it's uh, perhaps clearer that it's hexagon. You do see a center surrounded by six bumps and three T over four. Okay, so with color, you could, I've heard um, many of you go to APS, DFD, I'm sure, and you know that there are, um, there's a contest for the best videos and the best posters. And, um, you know, people say, oh, it's, uh, you know, the, obviously the numericists are going to win. They can always do these wonderful things. Well, in fact, one is told when one is a judge to judge um, numerics much more severely because indeed it is easy to make everything all colorful and gorgeous with numerics. Uh, so people get less credit for that. <laughs> they, they favor experiment. Okay, so this is the long time evolution of the hexagons. It took a while for Nicolas to get the hexagons. In fact, he had to communicate with the experimentalists that um, uh, about their parameters. And it turned out that they had made an error that, um, that their height was not what they thought it was. Uh, but after a couple months, uh, he got the hexagon. So that was nice. And these four points here are the four that you've just seen here. And this is a different view of them. Again, an illustration of all these nice things you can do with numerical representations. Uh, this is a contour plot showing these very same things. Uh, but I think you can see that hmm, maybe something else is going to happen. He kept, run he kept running it. He said, I said, why do you keep running it? It's perfectly nice. Oh, I don't know. It doesn't seem quite right. And indeed, he was right. If you look at, again, this is an envelope here of these oscillations. And after a while, it made a transition to this other pattern here. And these we call beaded stripes. And I think you can see why you have stripe, 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 stripes, and beads here. And it's got symmetries. Uh, here, this is a reflection symmetry in Y here around this. And there's also uh, a shift and reflect symmetry, which is if you go, if you translate, uh, excuse me, if you reflect in X, you don't have the same thing, but you also have to shift in Y. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see, if you reflect in X, you see you'll get something different because you see how this one here uh, would, is kind of slanted and you would get something with this slope. Okay, but if you then moved up to here, you would get the same thing again, right? Anyway, these are beaded stripes. Okay, now this one surely is stationary, right? Look how flat it is. Look how long lasting it is. Well, no, actually it makes a transition again to not exactly hexagons, but something that looked um, more like hexagons than the stripes. This thing here, this white patch is surrounded by six uh, other white patches. Again, this is periodic uh, in the horizontal directions. There's a vertical direction for the in resolution that you don't see. Um, so it's not quite hexagonal, but it's, it's kind of like that. That's why we call them quasi-hexagons. And that's what's happening here. And um, then, what well, wasn't finished, uh, it went back to beaded stripes, but not exactly the same. They're slightly different. You can see that this is the same as this, but it's quite different from this, which is thinner. So those who like, oh, um, let's see, do we write them? Yes, um, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so we went to, the, we had the quasi-hexagons here, we had the beaded stripes here, we then go back to quasi-hexagons here. And um, what we see about the symmetry now is that there's a spatio-temporal symmetry. Uh, this, with the triangle, with the kind of patches, was kind of a little bit like guitar picks here, like triangles here, but not but rounded. This one looks like this one, but reflected in X. So here's a reflection in X. This is a um, uh, this is a fa a shift in time uh, from this to this, from a from this one here from uh, this time to this time. And what does that mean, a shift in time? Well, because we have this beating, this oscillation, we have a phase. The phase is not arbitrary. We know that when we are, when we are here, say, we're at the time when, say, the, the um, dish is going down, and when we're here, we're when the dish is going up. So it means something to be here versus here. So we have this uh, shift and reflect um, 
that we mentioned before at, with a temporal phase shift. So that's a reflection in X, a shift in Y, because this is lower than this, and then a temporal shift like this. So uh, that's, uh, that's how these beaded stripes and these beaded stripes are related. You can see this is quite complicated. And then there's another, excuse me, these quasi-hexagons and these quasi-hexagons are related. And then there's another kind of beaded stripes that's related to these beaded stripes, the same way that these are related to these. Do I show them? No, I don't think so. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's all pretty amazing, very complicated. Um, are there questions right now? Yes, you sure? I have, a, I have a quick question. Good. Is that all viscid simulations? This is all viscous, that's right. This is Navier Stokes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Martin. Anything else, anybody else? Yes, can I ask you? Yes. Uh, but can you show like the period in comparison with this T3, T4, like the period of oscillation? This, oh. this axis here is okay. in periods, 30 periods, 60 periods, 90 periods. And ah, okay, this, is okay, one, okay. this is one period of response mm -hmm. and this is one period of forcing. Oh, okay, I got it, thank you. So this took a long time. I mean, in, uh, in um, you know, uh, this was this was not done on a supercalculator. It wasn't done in parallel. This was done on a laptop by Nicolas Perrine. Uh, he just kept it running all the time for months. Now we have faster things. Okay. Happy. Now we continue. Uh, may, maybe yes. I have a quick question. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> no, no, don't be sorry. I appreciate it. If I um, ask questions, it's because I want questions. I mean, when you look at these wonderful patterns, I mean, one may ask, I mean, how is that, so to say, in respect to numerical error that you might have, in particular, as you do long-term integration here? Um, well, I mean, that is an issue. I mean, we do a lot of, I mean, multi-phase simulations and numerical error is an issue there. I mean, so that's uh, the reason why I'm asking. Can you say something in that respect? Or maybe well, um, I think I can only talk philosophy. Um, I figure that, you know, error is random and small, and this must be an attractor, uh, you know, shadowing and that kind of thing. I don't know what, but that I'm, uh, I don't think that error would be so systematic as to bring you to something like this. Um, I would think on the contrary, perhaps if something like this was, it, you would find it, make it harder to see if it, this was kind of slightly unstable, that error would knock it off this path. So I would think that error would make it less likely to see something like this. Uh, that's, but again, this is just philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Okay. So I'll continue. These are strobed movies, four strobed movies shown at those times. So you can see, it helps you see, you know, you don't have that fast motion. Here, here it's at this beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, beaded stripes, quasi-hexagons. Beaded stripes, beaded stripes, uh, quasi-hexagons, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> not my, my uh, sound over is not so good. Quasi-hexagons, quasi-hexagons. Maybe it's finished. Yeah. Okay. Let's do them again. Maybe these. Um... Yeah. So that's that's strobed at the um, uh, at different phases. This is the zero phase, one quarter, one half, and then you can see the overall motion uh, instead of it's being blocked by the uh, you know being distracted by the um, Faraday oscillation. Okay, so um, I won't say that we know why this happens, but you know, as in as many times you, um, uh, uh, you know, we know a lot about it. So here's a um, uh, uh, here's an, a Fourier analysis using spatial Fourier spectra. And um, what is this? This is our domain. It turns out you might be, of course, it's obvious how you would see squares in a domain. It may not be so obvious, but to see perfect hexagons, what you need is to have a rectangle with aspect ratio one to square root of three. And what that gives you is that, okay, this is now Fourier space. And what you, this is now a grid on a rectangular space. And what you want 
is this is um, the basic. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, this is the basic hexagon so here. And you want this, this, and this to all be representable on your grid. Okay, so that you can uh, have perfect hexagons there. Um, so you, you, can't you can't do this on a square. You can do it, of course, on a very, very large domain, in which case you would have whatever approximates it best and maybe edge effects and so on. Okay, so this is our, our so we have a domain that's like this and a uh, physical and hence a Fourier grid that accommodates the hexagons. So this length is the same as this length is the same as this length is the same as this length. And you can't just do that with any grid to have something that's here and that's here and that's here all accommodated on this tensor product grid. Okay, given this, um, uh, this uh, Fourier grid, 2D Fourier grid, let us look at the Fourier spectra of the different uh, patterns we saw. Uh, so here are hexagons, and uh, we know that the uh, spectrum of a hexagonal pattern is itself hexagonal. That is to say, the four, it's its own dual or something. The, um, uh, this is the Fourier spectrum. So it, indeed, if you go back here, you have uh, amplitude here, amplitude here, amplitude here, 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 here. Uh, excuse me. No, I'm sorry. I'm not doing this right, am I? Um, no, I'm not doing. I'm not doing this right at all. I think I should have started here. Yes, here, 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 here. Right. This is not part of the hexagon. This, this, and this are, and this, and this, and this. Okay. So here's the hexagon here. And then these are harmonics. You know that nonlinear interaction means that this wave number plus this wave number equals this one. So it's excited, and this is a harmonic. Uh, involving these two. Okay. Now come the beaded stripes, and this is perfect because you have this structure in stripes like this, this and this, this is e to the i k y and e to the minus i k y, so this is sinusoidal and y, and then you have this little thing, and that corresponds to the beads. It's a weaker structure than the stripes. Then later we have the quasi-hexagons, and we see that we've gone back not I mean, we always knew that the quasi-hexagons did not look that hexagonal, but here we see that they include this and this, as they should, one, two, one, two, one, two, but they also have a lot of other things. Um, so they really are quasi-hexagons, not hexagons. And they have, uh, you see a certain asymmetry in them. You see that you have this and this that are, you see, uh, darker than this and this. And you see this and this are darker than this and this. Then you have the asymmetric beaded stripes, which look like the beaded stripes, except again, you have this asymmetry. You have something here, you have more than you had over here. Um, then you go to the other quasi-hexagons and this asymmetry here, where this and this are of higher amplitude than this and this, but it's reversed now. So this is the other kind of quasi-hexagons that we mentioned. And then this is the other kind of asymmetric beaded stripes, where here you had this, and now you have this. So we're, you know, at least even if we don't understand why, we at least have a lot of data about it. And here's what we did. We looked in time for these different spectral components. Um, which spec, uh, uh, the, okay, one, one, um, let's see. These are the three that make up the hexagon, that is to say, blue, black, and brown. So blue, uh, is it, I keep forgetting whether it's this one or this one. Uh, blue, let's say, yeah, let's say blue, black, and brown. And of course, there are complex conjugates over here, which have the same amplitude so that they can be real. So blue, uh, black, and brown. So when you have hexagons, all three have the same, um, the same amplitude, and that's here. Then when you go to beaded stripes, uh, you find that this blue stays at a high level. That's this one. And the black and brown are at a much lower level. Let's look at that in the previous one. That's this one that stayed. And these two really have, uh, have shrunk to almost nothing. Okay. 
Meanwhile, though, when you go to the beaded stripes, you have something new that's happened. This has appeared, and it was not here at all, here. And this is the one zero, it is this one, which is not of the same radius as these others. This is not part of a hexagon. Um, so that is this one here, say, and that's this one. So it was nothing before when you had hexagons and now it's shot up. So this guy is really involved as we saw before from the spectrum. And so during the asymmetric, uh, the beaded stripes, we have, these, we have this one being blue, this being high, it's a stripe one, and then these two and this one playing a role. We're now going to make a phase diagram here where we are not going to take into account the blue because it stays this pretty much the same. It's not gonna tell us much. We are instead going to take these three modes. And since these are almost the same, we're going to take this plus this and this minus this, and then this. So, Plotting in three dimensions, those three components, blue, black, black plus brown, black minus brown, and this black here, this is what we get. Here is the place where we have, um, uh, uh, where we have the hexagons, that's over here where black and brown are equal and high, okay, and, and they are not different, that's over there. And then we make a quick transition and this one rises, oops, and we get, uh, that's when we go up to the, uh, uh, over here, we get to the beaded stripes here. And that's here. And that's this long period here, T2. And we hang around a long time here and we have a right angle. So this reminds you, this is, this is almost stable. This is a saddle, pretty clearly it's a saddle. And um, then after that, we make an excursion like this. And that is one of these where um, uh, one one is greater than minus one one. You know, black is bigger than brown, and then brown is bigger than black, and then black is bigger than brown. And and this now we believe this goes on forever. We didn't then um, you know run longer to see if there was yet something else. This seems to go on for quite a long time. Let's just consider it to be the final thing. And so I'm, I'm, I should tell you now that I'm, tell, I'm planning to tell you three stories or so, maybe four, depending on the time I have. And this is the end of the first story, which is an exotic behavior. And these are the questions um, arising from, um, from this investigation. Um, um, so one question is, would we ever see this in a larger domain? This is a domain that accommodates exactly one um, hexagonal periodicity. Is it, uh, you know, it's stable for that, but in a larger domain, would it be stable? Are there large wavelength perturbations that would destroy? It? We don't know. And even aside from that, we saw before that, uh, oh, whoops, that's not what I meant. Here, we said this is a, this seems to be pro possibly a stable state, uh, excuse me, an almost stable steady state. And this seems to be a saddle. Is this a heteroclinic orbit? Is it, does it come from a heteroclinic orbit? Is it a hop? Is there a hop bifurcation somewhere? We don't know what's the bifurcation theoretic gen genesis of this behavior, even without it taking a larger domain or what. Also, one of the main things that happens in, um, uh, in Faraday patterns or many others is competition between squares and hexagons. Is this related to the competition between squares and hexagons somehow? Don't know. Um, then is this a common scenario, supposing, now again, without all these other questions, supposing you stick with this rectangular domain, uh, excuse me, this uh, minimal hexagonal domain, don't make a bigger one, um, is this a common scenario? I will actually answer that purely philosophically, yes, I figure that anything that I see is common because otherwise I wouldn't have seen it. I did not, we did not uh, plan this at all. This is just something that we saw. And so by, um, you know, this is a little like the, uh, what do you call the anthropic principle. That is that, um, uh, you know, uh, you have to, well, anyway, I, I believe it's likely, it's common because otherwise, we, you know, how likely you to see something unlikely. Uh, does it have to do with a rectangular grid? That would be unfortunate. That's a little related to Martin's question about the noise. Okay, so now let me go on to another story. This story is quite short, in case you're thinking, how is she going to have time? This is now a big square, which we then did in a, um, this was now using blue. It's not no longer Nicola's laptop. We have all of these squares. It's not one square. And look what it did. Spontaneously, the uh, square pattern divided itself into a waffle pattern. It divided itself into four, uh, four squares. Is that not strange? 
it um, you see how if you go across a line here, you're um, here you have these max and there you have these min. And the same here, max and then min. Uh, so these and these are in phase and these and these are in phase. Um, so isn't that odd? Uh, and so we like this. And then we discovered after, again, uh, this question of you know, how likely is it? It must be pretty likely. And afterwards we discovered this, um, these experimental pictures. This is from Duadi from 1990, whereas our article is from 2015, I believe, where he saw something just like it. And these are qu completely different parameters from Duadi's parameters. But um, anyway, so we saw it. And uh, I would think that mathematicians might like to attack all of these problems and see where they come from, uh, you know, from symmetry theory and equivariant bifurcation theory and all that. And so I, uh, you know, I leave these to you to, uh, if you have any friends or colleagues in this area, then uh, they're all challenges to you. So that's the end of story number two. So you see, I'm now whizzing through them. Story number three, let us um, make a, use a spherical drop and subject it to a radial oscillating force. This is of course something that's not so easy in nature because we have vertical gravity, but you might be able to do it in space with magnetic force, this or that. Anyway, let's, let's do that and see what happens. And um, what you end up with is, um, well, these are tongues. And um, this has to, this L corresponds to the L of spherical harmonics. You know that whenever you have spheres, uh, the natural thing is spherical harmonics. And um, uh, these are the tongues that you, that you, that we saw, uh, excuse me, that we calculated theoretically. And then um, maybe I'll get out of presentation mode for just a second. Should I dare this? Um, dare to do this? Um, do, 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 do. Maybe I shouldn't. No, I'll just keep doing it. Um, okay. So these are um, okay. So these are the results of Floquet analysis with different L's, spherical harmonic L's, and these are the shapes that we ended up simulating. This is. Uh, by changing the forcing frequency. So this is really nice. That is to say, back when we were talking about a planar surface, we indeed had K over here, the wave inverse wave number and amplitude, but K for a plane, that's only quantitative. That's having a wave that's like this or a wave that's like this. It's only quantitative. Whereas in spheres, it's qualitative. You have these very different shapes. This is a tetrahedron. This is an octahedron. And this is uh, some shape that doesn't have a name and so on. Uh, so you get by changing the frequency, so that, uh, uh, yeah, by changing the frequency, you get different shapes. And this is um, one of our simulations. This is the L equal two simulation. And you will see it's um, doing something that we call oblate prolate. Uh, so that's like a Frisbee and um, rugby ball. So this is rugby ball, frisbee, That's, it, it's a little bit slow. It's kind of nice to see the fluid flow around it too. This is, this is nothing, this is just solid. Uh, but you see, um, you see it now, and yeah, let me push it forward. Okay, and you see then the frisbee, rugby, frisbee, rugby, but look how it started to process. It started to process. And so that's something that we're studying now. Again, I don't know that we'll explain it, but we hope at least to get, other data about it, it processes spontaneously. In addition, what I told you, that is to say that it was oblate and prolate is not exactly the case because that implies uh, axis symmetry around an axis. And that's not true. There are three actual different axes. So that's the L equal two. Um, L equal three for, uh, uh, well, it turns out that we can uh, discuss these nice things that are the platonic solids. So everybody remembers the platonic solids. Perhaps you did a project in uh, high school um, or from them uh, with them. There's, you know, the pretty things. These are the five possible platonic solids. That is to say, you have a regular polygon, like a pentagon with equal sides, um, that you can, you can use that and they can close on each other. And there are exactly five of them. Um, the tetrahedron, the cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. And then there's such a thing as a dual. What is a dual? A dual is when you change a vertex to a 
a plane or to a face and a face to a vertex. So if you look here, you'll see that this um, cube has six faces. We know that one, two, three, four, five, six, and it's got eight vertices, whereas the octahedron has eight faces, faces, one, two, three, four, and then on the bottom, one, two, three, four, and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. And this is the result of uh, turning every vertex into a face and vice versa. Similarly, the dodecahedron is the um, uh, dual of the icosahedron. It's got the same uh, 12 faces, 20 vertices, 20 faces, 20 vertices, uh, 12 vertices. And the tetrahedron is its own dual. It's just upside down. And indeed, uh, Faraday waves are, a, uh, you know, just as any elastic body would do this, it's a great way to see it and its dual. And let's do that. Here's a tetrahedron, and it's going to turn into an upside down tetrahedron, right side, uh, right tetrahedron, upside down tetrahedron. And then here's a cu uh, cube, which is going to turn an octagon, cube, octagon, cube, octagon. And again, I remind you, this is done merely by changing the uh, forcing frequency. Here's this shape that has no, uh, here's, here's an uh, alternation between icosahedron and dodecahedron. And then here is a uh, L equal five shape, uh, which is uh, almost axis uh, metric. And then you may have noticed that we didn't mention L equal one. We started with L equal two. And so you might think, uh, what is uh, L equal one? I'll give you a moment to think about that. And I know that we're um, a little bit short on time. Now, L equal one, thinking about it? Thinking about it? Okay, so here's L equal one. Boing, 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 boing. We weren't expecting this. We, when we saw this, we thought it was so funny. Uh, boing, 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 boing. And so you can see how that's, uh, it, it can't be for capillary waves. It's not changing shape. Uh, so there's no, it's no ch uh, change, surface tension. It has to do with shape and curvature. This is not changing its curvature. Uh, so it can only happen in response to, uh, it's only gravity uh, as the counter force. Uh, and anyway, that's what it does. Uh, it's like a dipole going this way, then going that way. So plus and then minus and then plus and then minus. Okay. So our current project, again, this will be pretty short. Uh, this is an article from uh, experimental from uh, my uh, particular institute, the PMMASH, done by these researchers. And this is a square pattern. And what did they see? They saw this wavy modulation of that square pattern. And here is the stroke film. So you don't see this usual square. In a square pattern, you, the maxima, which are here, these little dots become minima, become maxima. And here is the film. This is what it's doing in time. The strobe at the Faraday period. This is experimental. And we wanted to um, um, simulate it. And our report is that we can. Here, we've simulated it. It does the same thing. Again, as with Nicolas, we had to, it took us a while to get it right because uh, we couldn't find it at the viscosity of the experimentalists. We have to have, it has a slightly different viscosity and the experimentalists indeed, they have a very hard time actually measuring the viscosity. Um, so they, they thought it was quite plausible that they had gotten the viscosity wrong. And in doing this, we found all these other gorgeous patterns. These are them, uh, these are quasi, they're not exactly hexagons. They can't be because this is a square shape and we said we needed a square root of three, but they're pretty good. And this is again, the, this is the Fourier space and not exactly hexagonal. We have these things that we call, you know, this is tilted squares. They are squares, but they're, they're, it's tilted. Uh, the wavy squares look like this where um, the square modes are here and then the red is responsible for the modulation. Uh, these are the pure squares. Um, so we found all these nice pictures and we're looking forward to investigating it further. And I finish here with a little advertisement for this code blue without which we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. It, it's their big thing is parallelization. As soon as a new machine comes out, they uh, parallel, they run it on it and they, they paralyze it to death at 131,000 threat. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's got all these features, blah, blah, blah. This is the kind of thing they like. They, Right. This is what they made it for. They uh, they um, uh, they collaborate a lot with Omar Matar from Imperial, um, where this is a uh, what is this jet with 
atomization or something fragmentation. And each of these little boxes, this is not the grid. Each of these boxes is a 32 by 32 by 32 grid. So you can see uh, it's um, their specialty is big. And uh, there, that's all I want to tell you. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Laurette, for, for this very, very interesting presentation. And uh, I see Martin is already, probably you want to ask a question, Martin. So I, I think we can uh, just start with the uh, question session. Yeah, first of all, many thanks, Laurette. Very, very interesting talk indeed. Um, thank um, you. Um, I have a question related to the model again. So you were saying that was viscous, right? Yes. And um, you had um, strong deformation of the surface, right? So it's not. Oh, yes. uh, no, no, not that. For us, no. I mean, they, um, my colleagues, they use, they, they push it very far, phase changes, little tiny drops. We're actually doing something that's very, um, in French, you'd say sage, uh, very gentle, very calm compared to that. We just have, uh, you know, we're not breaking the surfaces. We're not doing this mushroom. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about, no, no, not, I'm talking about not the last part here. I'm talking about the, 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 the um, that what I asked earlier about this waves that appear. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. More. yeah. Uh, yeah this, 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 yeah, yes, exactly, this, this part here. Yeah. Um, so, so what is the, what is the, um, what is the elevation of the, um, um, these, how do you call that? The, yes. The wiggles here compared yes. to the, to the, um, to lateral length scale. Is it a small parameter or not? Is it like... Well, Okay, how should I say? The only thing we can be is under-resolved. We don't use small parameters. I mean, not, nice. not consciously, but it's certainly possible that we're under-resolved. You can numericist. I can't claim that we did it over again at twice the resolution. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not questioning your numerics. Don't worry. Uh, I would just can, wondering... welcome to. Every numericist should, should, should welcome challenges to their... Um... <laughs> no, no, I was asking, I mean, the, 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 the wiggles we see here, are they sort of say physically, or is it just higher than reality, so to say? Uh, no, this is this is it. This is really it. This oh, is, is it? not a mapping. Oh. This is where the free surface is. I see. Okay, so it's not sort of say an, um, an amplification of the yeah. altitude, no. say, the lateral. No. Okay, okay. So so that is order one, um, really of the wave height. I would say. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, the, now, what is the role of viscosity? Do you have a feeling for that? I mean, you didn't mention Reynolds number. You are, uh, you're right. Um, it's a strange thing to go uh, from um, different worlds where Reynolds number is everything to Faraday where it's just another thing. It's, oh, by the way, the Reynolds number is this. You know, what do you mean by the way? It's, it's really not treated with the um, importance that I, it is in other fields and we can indeed a referee asked and we calculated it and we know what the Reynolds number is and I forgot what it is. I could look in the article um, uh, to see what it, what it is, but I don't know. It's not a very high Reynolds number. So you're talking about one, 10,000 or- I'm 100. thinking something like 50 or a hundred. I see. I Some see. really moderate thing. Right, right, right. I'm asking this question because of the following reason. Um, there is something that you, you might, might know that is what is called the focus unified method. Um, that is a technique that was developed in the last 20 years by a mathematician from Cambridge. And that allows you to actually find exact solutions to nonlinear boundary, um, uh, free boundary value problems. And we applied that, for example, for droplet oscillations. Um, but, and that is the key point that we were only able to do that for inviscid flows. Ah, oh, yes, yes. So, so I mean, mm -hmm. so the, the, the point is we, we have, so to say, a fully geometrically nonlinear theory, but it's all inviscid. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, we, we, I, was, I was really intrigued by what you're showing here. And I was thinking if we could apply the method also to this, but it will be all inviscid. Yeah. Well, uh, we could always see if this, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I don't have any philosophy to offer here. Yeah. Yeah. Neither yeah. philosophy okay. nor facts. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
so we can uh, uh, see if there are other questions. So to the participants, if you want to ask a question, just unmute your mic. Yeah, Johan. You know, I was also wondering about this alternation about uh, hexagons and, and stripe and uh, bidded stripe. So uh, I see that you have, uh, you work on this one, but have you managed to do more simulations by varying parameters to see if they somehow bifurcate from something? No, 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 no. As um, let's see, as I wrote here, this is all there is. <laughs> Anyone else is welcome to uh, uh, to take over this problem. And I mean. I feel that each of these, okay, each of these things is a, th is a PhD thesis, could be a PhD thesis. They haven't been, uh, yeah, each of these things, uh, that could be a PhD thesis. And in fact, I would say each of these, each is its own PhD thesis to really, uh, yes, I don't know. I don't know. I, I would hope, think that mathematicians would kind of take this over or fluid mechanicians. Uh, but no, I've told you everything I know about each of those. Thanks. Mm. I suppose it shouldn't be too complicated since the, I mean the simulations were done ten years ago, and I guess that now you have more combinational right. powers and the same. That's right. I, yes, yes, it should not be so difficult. That's right. I agree. I have a quick question. <laughs> um, it's okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Lloyd. Um, you, you, you told that uh, the Reynolds number is not, is not so important, but... Uh, oh, I didn't mean, I, I didn't really mean but, that. I mean, no, I but, uh, my question was, uh, couldn't we expect some kind of uh, secondary atomization at the top of these? Because uh, I was looking at some pictures of uh, droplets in acoustic fields or things like that, and you have many, many <laughs> generations of this. Uh, Surely by pushing up the amplitude, um, or one would find atomization, as you say for higher amplitude. Hmm. And in fact, here I should, uh, let me go back to um, something else, just a second. Uh, Come on. Yes, okay, this, uh, this thing here, um, uh, the, the scaling of the critical amplitude, which here is whatever it is, it's, uh, you know, really tiny here. We don't really care about the upper tunnels. We only care about the lower. This scales like new, pretty much linearly with new. I don't know how I don't know how much I'm answering your question, but um, there. It's even funny that people plot it as a over g when really new should be figuring here because that's what this distance is. This mm. distance is new. Did I address a little bit? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. No, surely there is atomization if you go high enough. Okay. Um, so is there some other question? Maybe uh, Antoine, just go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. It was uh, fascinating, I would say. Maybe a quick question. I have a question about the boundary condition uh, you are using on the side of your domain. And Periodic. Those... Periodic. Yes. And uh, yes, this is what I guessed. Uh, and if you, because in the experiments, uh, doing a periodic uh, boundary condition, it's uh, almost impossible. So yes, yes. does it does it has an effect on the on the patterns you you could? Uh, okay, here I will tell you philosophy. Um, the idea is, um, I mean, and this is, you know, it's not just for this problem, it's always uh, the case. Come on, come on, come on. The only time that we've actually done deliberately a comparison with experiment and uh, numerics is uh, this time recently. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There. They we're deliberately comparing. This is a picture of the, the experiment. And what we are simulating is a periodic domain like this, or if you like, like this. And our idea is that, um, uh, how should I say, we, we're not, I mean, indeed, of course, they have, must have edge effects. I don't think this is the whole photograph. Probably this, they, cut, they took only the center of it, probably. Um, but our goal is not to simulate, uh, you know, something with a meniscus over here. The idea is, to simulate something, I mean, the idea is that the, I'll claim that the experimentalists 
would like to be studying something which is homogeneous and doesn't have edge effects. And we are accomplishing that in a smaller domain, a smaller periodic domain. There. That's what I'll say about this. About the hexagon, same thing. The, this is why the um, this question that I asked about the hex, of course, we don't have to ask that about the sphere. That's a nice thing about the sphere. They don't have any edges, right? Uh, <laughs> but of course, you can't you can't keep it up there and do a radiating oscillator. So that has its own problems. But um, this question I asked about the hex hexagon, about what would happen in a larger domain, this was done in a really minimal domain. I mean, I'm, I haven't really shown you how minimal it is because these are actually... Um, I think this is four times the calculation domain here. This is reproduced four times to look uh, look better. I think our actual so this is um, this is actually not at all related to an experiment because uh, the idea of you know you really your edges if you had it you can't this is not in the middle of one. Uh, but hence this question of um, what would happen in a larger domain. Probably this wouldn't happen. I think it's an interesting mathematical scenario because the minimal hexagonal domain is actually an interesting thing. The idea of this box that is lambda by square root of three lambda, you know, what happens in it, uh, you know, that's, it's not just any size, it's, it's the minimal hexagonal domain. And if this is a common thing that happens in that box, that's an interesting mathematical um, uh, scenario to have something so complicated. Um, Experiment, probably not, but who knows? Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, so is that, yeah, Felipe, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, oh. let me say one more thing. Um, these super squares here, these we did with uh, periodic, you can see it's different. This periodic and Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions at the edge, and okay. it happened in all three of those. So this, this for this, we really did see that there was boundary condition independent, which is what I would believe for large domains. Okay, thank okay. you. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, right. So thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was, I'm curious if um, the underlying physics here is related to this Kladni plate, uh, where you put sand on a vibrating plate. Well, we it's kind of where the we, patterns are fixed yes, in time, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I should know this better, but I don't. Uh, the idea is no. Uh, the Kladni plates are reflecting the um, uh, are the modes of the shape of the plate. We would like to think that what we have is more or less independent of the, or in some sense, independent of the shape of the plate. We, we like to think that we are uh, studying, you know, a large homogeneous domain and mechanisms that create patterns that are not uh, just um, the eigen, you know, the eigen modes of the drum uh, thing. Thanks. <laughs> mm. Oh, and I'm sorry, and one of the ways to ensure that, this was a reflection by Stuart Edwards, who discovered the quasi patterns a long time ago was that um, for this reason it's important uh, to have viscosity because viscosity um, it shortens your um, do I have this right um, uh, it shortens your correlation length and you're feeling the boundaries less do I have this right somebody who, who's uh, more physical minded than I am um, if you have viscosity um, the influence of the boundaries acts only a few, um, uh, only a little bit inside from the boundaries. And then after that, it's kind of left to its own devices. It's a bulk fluid. Whereas in an inviscid fluid, the influence of the boundaries is, uh, would be felt uh, everywhere. Do I have that right? Anyway, there, that's, uh, I'm finished with that reflection. Um, any any more questions? I just remind you that you can uh, either uh, ask it uh, by yourself, like uh, or write in the chat. I can report it. Okay, so maybe I can ask you a couple of questions. Myself. Mm -hmm. um, can you go back to the uh, dynamics uh, where? You, yeah, that's it. That's that's this. Um, if you go. To the last uh, 
um, a transparency where you have all the peaks uh, plotted. Yeah, and the, yes. Um, maybe it's just an impression of mine and you may confirm mm -hmm. it, but I see somehow the, the maximum of the peaks that's kind of drifting up um is it is it the case i mean the, do, do you in the plot like in the red like the red uh uh the red line um uh, the, the the red line you have at the top left panel um ah, yeah uh, 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 i see um you're thinking um is, is there a chance that you're drifting back to the hexagons <laughs> Maybe um, all the, okay. I should say all this work was done by Nicola. Uh, I I mean I helped to organize it, but he was really Nicola Perine. If uh, he's in Chile uh, now, has been uh, pretty much since then he settled there. Uh, he is he, he's the guy. I can point you to this as yeah. the, um, it doesn't seem as though it's going to hexagons. Not at all. I will say. Uh, we're at the quasi hexagons. Those are the things that's between, say, T3 and T4. So that would be uh, the path from T3 to T4. It looks quite far from this T1, which is when it was at the um, at the hexagons to begin with. I will say no. I mean, something might still be happening, but be re becoming hexagons, it really does not. This point, uh, th this trajectory during which it was a um, quasi hexagon does not look like that at all in phase space. Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking that maybe hexagon is kind of a rare event in an oscillator, which is which is going from one condition, like from... Yeah. Well, yeah. I say nobody, I believe, has ever looked at this uh, after we did. And, uh, you know, uh, you're yeah. welcome to speculate, to run things, to... Okay. Yeah, whatever. I have, <laughs> I've told you everything I know. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. But yes, no, that would be, that would be interesting. I don't think it's a rare event. I believe it's an unstable fixed point. And once you've left, you've really left. Uh, I'm certainly willing to believe that there might be something besides that, but I doubt that you would go back ever to anything that looked like hexagons. And I doubt that it went to this kind of uh, by chance, it went to this because it was originally a flat surface and very regular and this and that and i don't think it would ever visit this again but that is just talk okay 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 and um i do have another question regarding the connection between this picture and the other the 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 3d uh um that's very called uh, uh faraday waves oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah because i mean uh um, <coughs> you you were talking about uh, passing from one mode to 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 another mode. Like, uh, is, is there any like uh, uh, is there any consistency between like two uh, D plus time and three D plus time uh, when you talk about passing from a uh, from a, like a platonic solid to its dual? Uh, can the stripes be considered like? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't uh, understand. Uh, can you... Um... In, in, in the videos you have afterwards, uh, you you show that the the droplet, yeah, deforms, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. It deforms from a, a, a platonic solid to its dual. Yes. Uh, and um, does this apply to 2D as well? So can, uh, can, can it yes. be... Yeah, yes. It only looks uh, trivial. What it means is you've gone from this to yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, okay, and in this sense, is there a chance or is, is there like any uh, study which looked into uh, including time in this transformation? I mean, uh, uh, rather than processing the, the solids in 3D, processing them in 4D or like having time as a, as a dimension of the, of the solid, something like that? Well, I think I'm pretty safe in saying no. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, because it's looking very periodic, so... Uh, oh, it's, I, I think it's it perfectly periodic. It, it's perfectly periodic. Yeah, so, yeah. My, I, I, periodic states. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so that's uh, that was uh, basically all from my side. Let's see if there is someone else who would like to ask a question. Uh, so just feel free to unmute your mic or um, write in the chat. Um, okay, so this doesn't seem to, to be the case. So thank you once again, uh, Lorette, for the Thank you very, for the opportunity. Thank all of you for your questions and for your attendance and curiosity, etc. I mean, how should I say? Um, yeah, it's, I think it's easy to speak. It's hard to listen. <laughs> so I commend you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, so I wish you a good evening. And I thank you. See you once thank again you. In a week. And enjoy Rencontre Non Linéaire. All <laughs> of you who have the good fortune to go there. Sure. Okay. A good evening. Goodbye.